Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming out for our monthly Tread Talk. We're so glad you're joining us this morning. We may have some more that filter in here as we go. You know, we're so pleased this morning to have with us members of the Manhattan Fire Department. Um, the museum purchased this 1927 Chevrolet fire truck about three years ago. It had been purchased new by Sinclair Oil Company and used in a refinery in Tulsa from 1927 through 1959, at which time it went into retirement. They kept the truck until about 1969 and sold it and went through uh, several different ownerships. The last gentleman that owned it before we bought it was a retired fireman. He restored it in 1993 or around that time uh, to exactly the way it was. Our understanding is some of the equipment on the truck is original truck. Maybe these guys will be able to tell us if that's the correct vintage. There's some Child's Fomite, Formite uh, fire extinguishers. My understanding is this was the last year uh, for this uh, Child's fire equipment truck before they were sold to American La France. Maybe these guys will tell us more about that too. So hopefully they'll tell us a little bit about our truck too because we'd like to learn some more about it. As of July 31st uh, this year, registered fire departments in the United States have about 1,207,500 personnel including career volunteers and paid per call firefighters, as well as civilian and non-firefighting staff. Of those, 1,056,000 are active firefighters, which is almost 87% of the total personnel. The breakdown of active firefighters is 35% career, 52% volunteer, and 13% per call. Firefighters are often the first line of defense for their communities in many types of emergencies, including fires, vehicle accidents, natural disasters, and more. Um, please join me in applauding these gentlemen, not only for their presentation today, but for their service to our community. <laughs> I'm going to have them introduce themselves, so I'll turn it over to you guys. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, it's great to be here today. When we uh, talked about a month ago about this uh, event today, I was pretty excited because it's a really neat deal. and. I, have a great turnout and everything. So uh, we've been looking forward to this, but uh, my name's Grady Windrot. I'm a captain with Manhattan Fire. Uh, Dave Kordiak is our driver. So he's driving uh, engine four out there today. And then Eric Leverud is our firefighter. So uh, we're excited to be here. Um, we're just kind of go, gonna go over a little bit of uh, history uh, and kind of what we do today, as opposed to what we did uh, a hundred years ago or more now and kind of the difference in uh, uh, fire trucks. Obviously, uh, what's the first thing you kind of see, you look at this truck and the one that's parked outside is the size. <laughs> fire trucks are much, much larger today than they, than they were a uh, hundred years ago. Um, and a big reason for that is uh, our scope of what we do has increased dramatically. Uh, not only over the hundred, last hundred years, but really just in the last 20 years, uh, what we do today as opposed to what we did you know, 20 or 30 years ago is so much more. So we carry a lot more equipment on our trucks than we did 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Uh, so that's one big reason for the size difference in the trucks now. Uh, the other thing would be that just the technology and uh, what's in them. And we're, we're kind of, we'll get into some of that later, but little history of, well, I guess uh, kind of what we do today are, are like normal daily activities. Uh, we work 24 hour shifts. So we came on, we got to work at eight o'clock this morning and we'll be here till eight o'clock tomorrow morning. Uh, we have our station, our home away from home, uh, where we eat, sleep, work, train, uh, do public relations like this. Uh, that's what our normal day is made out of. Um, that's eight to five, we're working on all that stuff. And then after five uh, is kind of our light duty time. So at that point, we're, we're in station doing what we want to do as long as we're in station and ready to respond to any calls. Uh, and then of course, whatever comes up, uh, we got to be ready to do. So that's kind of our uh, breakdown of what we do on a daily basis. Uh, we do a lot of training, um, 240 hours a year we, we have to have logged and uh, we do much more than 240 hours normally. So uh, we're prepared for about anything uh, that comes our way. Uh, we talked about the scope of what we do is so much more now than it was uh, a couple decades ago. And if, if something comes up and you don't know who 
who takes care of that problem, you call the fire department. Uh, that's just the way it is, and that's, uh, that's why we do so many more things today than we used to. So, We'll get into a little bit of history of the uh, Manhattan Fire Department. Uh, it was first organized in 1884, and I'll, I'll kind of use the term organized very loosely. Um, and then the fire service in general, uh, big events uh, create change. And in 1884, there was a large fire in Manhattan, uh, 200 block of points, uh, burned most of the block down. And that's when the city leadership decided we need to do something. So they organized a, uh, a fire department at that time. And it wasn't much of a fire department. It was uh, a bucket br brigade. So you can see uh, uh, Firefighter Jankovic on the left there holding a bucket. and. That's how they fought fire uh, in those days. And it was just a, a group of volunteers that said, hey, I'll, uh, you know, I'll volunteer to uh, come dump some water on a fire. Uh, and they were alerted by somebody running down the streets uh, yelling fire. Uh, and then they would grab their buckets from home and find where that fire was in town. Obviously, the city was much smaller then, so uh, it was pretty easy to find the fire, I think, at that point, but uh, that's all it was. Uh, and that ended up being the case for quite a while, uh, just a few people with buckets dumping water on a fire. Not much technology there. Uh, the other picture in there, uh, that's a hose cart. So you, we, there's a little bit of hose on there, but uh, they would put a bunch of hose on that cart and then people would pull that cart to the fire. That was the big, uh, big step in technology and innovation then. Uh, so in 1892, that's what they were fighting fire with. Um, and in 1892, they kind of got a little more organized and ended up with uh, their first paid staff. Uh, so that was eight years after originally organizing as a fire, uh, fire department. Uh, and they had a fire, a building, a fire station uh, downtown on points that, uh, that's where they had their, housed their equipment. And again, it was just somebody running through the streets yelling fire. And when that happened, these paid firefighters would run to the fire station, grab that cart, and then run to the fire. Uh, and they got pretty efficient at uh, getting their equipment to the fire, but once they were there, they had just uh, pulled all their equipment running, and I would be pretty tired if we had to do that today. So uh, that was a big uh, drawback. They, they were efficient at getting their equipment to the fire, but once they were there, obviously they were tired and, and gassed. And, I couldn't imagine uh, trying to fight fire today after running, you know, however many city blocks uh, carrying our equipment there. So, uh, especially in the summertime <laughs> now, I, hopefully we don't have any uh, fires here this week, but uh, uh, we're prepared for it if we do. So, um, also around the same time, they installed uh, water mains in the city. And water mains included some fire hydrants. There weren't very many of them. so. Uh, that was the main job of the hose cart, was catching a, a fire hydrant and then getting the rest of the hose to the fire scene. Um, in 1910, we progressed to horses pulling that equipment. So for a long time, they just uh, carried or pulled a cart themselves. Uh, 1910 was the first uh, team of horses uh, that was doing that for them. And then they just pulled, those horses just pulled a wagon with equipment on it. And that's how they got their equipment to the fire scene. Then of course they, they still had to catch a fire hydrant, still deploy some hose and put water on the fire. Uh, one interesting thing, uh, doing a little research, uh, was about how much these guys were paid at that point. Uh, so in 1910, I believe there was, uh, there was a fire chief, a driver, or two drivers for the, the horses, 
and uh, eight firefighters that were paid, and that was their staff. Firefighters made $2 a month. The fire chief made $10 a month. And I'll let uh, somebody take a guess about how much the drivers made. Any ideas? The drivers made $60 a month compared to $10 the fire chief was making. So <laughs> uh, that's certainly not the case now. Our drivers don't make six times more than the chief. So, <laughs> but uh, uh, you think about it, yeah. Did they have to pay the horses? Is that what they paid? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was uh, the most skilled position on the fire department at that time was uh, the person driving the horses. But they had to feed them, right? They took care of the horses. Uh, they were always there. Uh, that's why there's two of them. They always had somebody at the station caring for the horses, where the others, uh, the other firefighters weren't always there. So, uh, yeah, a lot more responsibility for the drivers, a lot more skilled uh, labor went into into what they did and that's why they were paid more but I thought that was very interesting that they made that much more money than the the chief the head of that department so um, 1914 they bought their first motorized truck and at that point it was still just a it was just a truck it wasn't a fire engine it didn't have a pump it was still just hauling equipment to the scene so still pretty, pretty crude uh, firefighting tactics. Just get your equipment there, hook a hose to a hydrant somewhere, and then the water you get out of that hydrant is the water you get. So moving forward into 1928, which is uh, they bought their first fire engine, and that's the, the one you see on the bottom there. And it's a 1928 Seagraves. And that pump uh, was, had the capacity of 600 gallons a minute. That was, uh, that was a lot for back then, especially going from no sort of fire pump to 600 gallons a minute. That was uh, quite the advancement in technology there. Uh, around the same time, early 20s, they built a new fire station on 3rd Street. And that's the one you see in the background on the bottom there. And that's where they, they still housed uh, all of their equipment there, that new fire engine. And then in 1930, they purchased the truck on the top. And uh, if you can't tell, that's a, that's a ladder truck uh, where it actually has a, a big aerial ladder attached to it. Today we use a uh, hydraulic to maneuver those uh, those ladders and position them everywhere. This was all just cables and ropes that uh, uh, deployed that ladder. So uh, quite an advancement, but still pretty crude. Took a lot of work and a lot of manpower to, uh, to get those ladders into position. But you see the ground ladders on the side of this truck here. Uh, that's what they had to work with up until then. Uh, and then this, and I can't uh, remember how, how tall that ladder is on that truck. Uh, but it was probably around 60 feet. Um, so that's uh, quite a bit more uh, uh, capacity in what you can do. Now, 1930, when they bought that truck, uh, you can tell from the pictures that truck is quite a bit larger than the one on the bottom. What's that? Yeah. Yep. Uh, I mean, those, those ladder sections are about 20 feet, and there's uh, so you need at least that plus the cab, uh, that truck uh, had a pump on it as well, which they don't, not all the ladder trucks do, but this one Always did. Red. Uh, in Manhattan, as far as I know, we've only had red trucks. Uh, there are certainly different colored fire trucks out there. Um, a lot of them are green, some are white. Denver has white fire trucks, which doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, I, would, I would say uh, any place where it snows, you wouldn't want a white fire truck, but uh, they do so. Um, but in 1930, when they bought that truck, their fire station was nowhere near large enough to house that that truck. So they knocked the back wall out of the fire station and extended that truck bay so they could fit that new uh, ladder truck in there. Only eight years later, they had to knock the wall down again because they got another larger fire truck. 
that's been going on for 100 years, and it <laughs> still happens today. And uh, not too long ago, we bought a, uh, a newer truck that we had to make some modifications to a fire station so it'd fit in it. So it's still going on. They're still making trucks larger and larger, and we're still modifying or completely, t completely tearing down fire stations and building new ones to fit these bigger fire trucks in. So this truck that you see parked in the weeds there, that's the, the 1930 American LaFrance ladder truck that was in the, the pictures on the previous slide. Uh, on the left is a photo where it's actually uh, actively fighting fire. Um, but five years ago, we found this truck in a field uh, in eastern Kansas somewhere. Uh, it was in service in Manhattan for a long time, and then obviously when we upgraded, it went away and was disappeared for decades. But somebody had found it, made contact uh, with the Manhattan Fire Department, and we bought it back. Um, that's the state it was in, and sadly, that's still kind of the state that it's in now. Um, but we're hoping eventually we can uh, restore that truck into uh, Maybe not something quite as nice as this, but uh, what old engine one is uh, out there, if you haven't looked at that out there, um, I hope you do, and we'll be out there later to kind of go over that. But uh, uh, we'd love to be able to get it roadworthy again, uh, fix it up to where we can use it for public relations events and uh, have it in a parade, but uh, that's currently the state that it's in. Um, and you can see that none of the ladders are on there. We actually have all the old wood ladder sections, um, and I don't know if they're uh, fixable. I don't think they are, but we still have them, and hopefully could uh, recreate those ladders. Re you know, build new ladders off of what we what was on there originally, because we we still have all the pieces of the ladders. So, uh, our, originally, our plan was when we bought that truck back was to restore it and have it uh, ready to go by its 100th anniversary, which is six years from now. Um, I don't know if that's feasible. Uh, funding's a big issue now, so uh, hopefully in the next few years we can get somewhere on that and, and make that uh, a reality, get that truck back on the road. Um, yeah. How do you know that that's a truck is on the number of it? Yeah, it's all serial numbered and, and it actually has uh, uh, some of the old uh, decals on it that you can actually see, so yeah, yeah. So this next picture, uh, old engine one is the truck that's on the right there. Um, it looks very similar to that today. Uh, it's a 1947 American LaFrance. And that truck was in service in Manhattan for over 40 years uh, as a first out truck for a long time and then as a reserve truck through the 80s. Uh, when I started uh, 18 years ago with MFD still had several people who rode on that truck that I worked with, uh, so that's pretty interesting. But uh, it was retired in the late 80s, and then throughout the 90s, they never got rid of that truck. So that stayed here in Manhattan, and there was a, a large group of uh, some retired firefighters, some you know firefighters that were still active that time, put a lot of work into restoring that truck and turning it into a parade truck. Uh, if you haven't looked at it out there in the hose bed, there's uh, seats, so we can uh, with seat belts and everything in there. It's uh, handicapped accessible. We can actually get a wheelchair up on uh, into the hose bed, and and somebody in a wheelchair can ride that truck. So uh, we use it quite often uh, for event like this. Uh, we have it, most of the parades in Manhattan. That truck will ride in it. Uh, carries the commissioners a lot. Uh, our open house, that, which is coming up in uh, October, uh, it'll be there and giving rides to kids and whoever wants to ride on it. Uh, a couple other events that we do uh, rides with uh, throughout the year, but we use it a lot. Uh, and that was a, a pretty big community project when they restored that truck and turned it into what it is today. Uh, the Lions Club was a big, uh, big benefactor in, in uh, 
getting that project done. But a lot of people put a lot of work into that. They had the, the original engine and transmission in it uh, when they first uh, restored that. And I never got the chance to drive it with that. It had a you know an old uh, standard transmission in it that I've heard was uh, not much fun to drive. Uh, very hard to uh, shift gears in the thing, but uh, in the 2000s then, uh, they were having so much issues with the engine and transmission that they actually uh, took that out and put a small block Chevy and an automatic transmission in it. So it's now much easier to drive, but uh, it's still made for uh, people in the 40s. Uh, so it's, it's pretty difficult, uh, not difficult, just uh, it's not very ergonomic to uh, to climb in there and drive it uh, to get uh, to get your foot up on the the brake pedal. I mean, I got to pick my knee up into my chest. So uh, driving in a parade when you have your foot on the brake pedal the whole time is uh, <laughs> it'll wear you out. But I still I love driving that truck. Actually, I drove it over here this morning. So here's another picture of it uh, just in station and kind of you see what we're wearing today. Uh, Obviously, the uniforms has changed. We don't wear a, a hat and tie every day. Uh, we actually had a conversation about this not too long ago, and <laughs> I was saying we probably don't need to go back to this, but uh, our uh, our uniform has certainly changed, and uh, uh, a lot of guys would rather just wear some athletic shorts and a t-shirt all the time, but uh, <laughs> I'm kind of opposed to that. But So this is what we're working with today. Um, fire pumps became a thing kind of in the 20s where you actually had the ability to uh, increase the pressure of the water you had uh, which was a, a big thing uh, today this is engine 4 on the left which is a truck we have out there parked in front of the museum and Quint 3 uh, we talked a little bit about how that old ladder truck, everything was run off of ropes and cables. Um, the ladder on top of this truck here, Quint 3, is 107 feet, and it's uh, all hydraulic and electric driven, and we can deploy that ladder in a matter of a couple minutes anywhere we want to. So uh, a lot of technology goes into that truck. Um, so for engine four, it was purchased in 2015. It has a 1500 gallon gallon per minute pump on it. And that's kind of the industry standard now is 1500. Uh, they certainly make them much larger than that, like this old uh, refinery truck. Uh, refinery trucks now, they can pump 6,000 gallons a minute. Uh, of course, that's for a large, you know, fuel fire or something like that. But uh, uh, 1,500 gallons a minute is very standard. Our largest uh, pump we have is 2,000 gallons a minute. So uh, you can pump a lot of water, uh, build a lot of pressure upwards to 350 psi. Um, but you're still kind of uh, hindered by the amount of water you can get out of a fire hydrant. So. The city has uh, upgraded our water mains and, and hydrants drastically over the last you know, couple decades. Um, all those small four inch mains like downtown are pretty much gone and now they're large. I think a lot of them are 12 and 18 inch mains. So uh, most of our hydrants we can get 15 to 2,000 gallons a minute out of. Yeah. Your trucks uh, got the ability to carry water in inlets. Yep. Uh, so all of our trucks now have 500 gallons of water on board. Um, so that's enough water to uh, do a lot, to do most things. Um, now if we have a, a house that uh, is on fire and, and more than just like one room and its contents, uh, we need more water than that 500 gallons. Uh, but uh, typically with any kind of a structure, if there is a fire, we will catch a fire hydrant. Um, but something less than that, we can do uh, like 500 gallons on board, so uh, we can do a lot with that. But um, any ideas on how much a fire truck costs today? 
Any, anybody want to make a guess? Half a million? More. Half a million would be a very, very cheap one, actually. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so in 2015, when we bought that uh, bought Engine 4, it was $800,000. Uh, today, just for a, a truck like that, it would be about a million. Uh, and the ladder on top of it, like Quint 3 has, adds about a quarter million dollars. So uh, lots of money. Um, and the reason for that is, well, there's lots of reasons for that, but the the amount of technology that goes into fire trucks today is uh, uh, pretty insane. A lot of that goes towards keeping us safe inside them. Uh, safety has become a, well, it's always been a, a important in the fire service, but over the last 20 years, um, that has really became a, a focal point, and uh, that's something that cities are willing to spend money on, and then that's why uh, fire trucks have continued to evolve like that. Um, so, a little few stats on just engine four. It has a 470 horsepower, 1,650 foot pounds of torque. So, that's a pretty big, uh, it's a Detroit diesel engine in it. Uh, it'll get up and go, but it's also governed to 65 miles an hour. We can't go any faster than that. Uh, but the acceleration on it is, is pretty good, and that's really what we need while we're in town, uh, getting, through, getting through traffic quickly and safely. Uh, it has independent front suspension, which has made a huge difference in the, the comfort and uh, rideability on those trucks. Uh, that independent front suspension, uh, well, just, People's backs would hurt, you know, driving through town, bouncing around, because uh, those are heavy trucks, very heavy trucks, actually, with all the equipment and water that we carry on them. Uh, so that's been a, a very, a much appreciated uh, advancement. Uh, airbags with side roll protection in them, airbags all around in them. Uh, very, very safe, much safer now. Uh, and of course, seat belts. 30 years ago, seat belts weren't even, not all fire trucks even had seat belts in them. Uh, now they're certainly required, everybody's required to wear them. And there's even a, uh, we have an alarm that, and a display up front that says which seat is occupied and whether they have their seat belt on or not. So, uh, and that's the responsibility of the, the driver and the captain to, make sure that before that truck is moving, everybody's got their seat belt on um, because it's going to be making noise if, if you're not anyways, but yeah. Backup cameras. Um, trucks have backup cameras on them. Also, when we're backing up a truck, we're standing outside the truck and in the mirrors and making sure the driver can see you and helping them back up. Uh, Quint 3 here. Um, uh, you can't hardly see in this picture, but it's got outriggers to keep that truck stable while you got that big ladder up in the air. Um, it's got cameras above the outriggers, and uh, it'll bring up a picture of where you're at, and it'll show you where those outriggers are going to sit when they're deployed. So you can turn that, flip that camera on when you're pulling up the scene and make sure you're going to miss any curbs or cars or whatever else in there. Even a right turn signal, you flip your turn signal on and you get a camera show you down the right side of the truck because they're large trucks and, and the streets aren't getting much bigger at all, um, but the trucks sure are, so. Uh, all of our trucks now have hydraulic driven generators on them, so uh, we use a lot of well, any kind of power tools, a lot of it's going to just battery stuff now, but the hydraulic driven generators are pretty nice. You just push a button and you have as much uh, electricity as you need off that truck. Big cord reels, uh, 250 foot long cords on them, so you can get electricity any, anywhere on scene that you need to. Uh, another uh, pretty neat uh, piece of technology on them is a pump panel on there, which is all, it's configured pretty nice to where the driver can just stand there and while he's operating the truck, 
uh, any lever he pulls there is opening a valve to open a, uh, a discharge for a hose or um, but one thing there's discharges on the opposite side of the truck and those have uh, electric or air operated valves on them so that driver doesn't have to leave that pump panel station so uh, he can sit right there stand right there and, and pretty much operate that entire truck from one spot uh, so one thing uh, over the last probably 15 years is intercom headsets that uh, I don't know if you see see us going down the street and everybody's wearing the, the intercoms fire trucks are really loud especially when we got the um, sirens and, and air horns going uh, but now we have headsets that everybody wears uh, it's connected through our radio we can talk to uh, dispatch or other trucks through those headsets but uh, it's very important that as we're responding to a call that we can talk to each other and everybody knows what's going on what their assignments gonna be when we get there uh, we couldn't do that before without the headsets and now we can do that so uh, and they're noise canceling you can't hardly hear anything except what uh, we're talking to each other about so uh, that's uh, there's a lot of old firefighters that uh, can't hear very well um, and there's a lot of things that uh, a lot of reasons for that uh, but that's a big one is uh, responding in the trucks with the sirens going and uh, that's not a that's not an issue anymore uh, you still have to remember to put your earplugs in or ear protection when you're running a saw or something like that but uh, we're a lot better about that too so another thing with the the aerial truck is uh, the technology that has gone into that now is it's kind of we call it they firefighter proofed it so it's hard to uh, break stuff now uh, we still have lots of guys that break stuff but uh, so that truck like we talked about everything's ran hydraulically on it but it will not let you run that ladder into the truck itself anymore and there's also a, a safety feature on it where it's, if it feels like the truck is not as stable as it should be it'll stop your ladder from going any further to that side of the truck and an important thing about that feature is it allows us to short jack that truck if we don't have enough room to get our outriggers all the way out one side we can just put it a little ways out or not at all just put it down and then we can still go on the other side of that truck but it won't let us go that side to where we could uh, topple that truck over so uh, and all that technology uh, I mean it it's done a lot of great things for us but we also have a lot of electrical issues with our uh, equipment now uh, which is not so much fun but especially for our uh, mechanics at the the city but, uh, a couple other uh, options that are on fire trucks now that we don't have um, one is a rear steer with independent suspension on the rear, which uh, those are very, very heavy trucks and they have to build those suspensions very heavy to carry all that weight. And to, to make it trucks more maneuverable, they've added rear steer to some of those. So uh, some of those trucks can turn very, very tight in a you know small space. And it's pretty impressive to, uh, to see a truck that large make these uh, very tight corners. Uh, we haven't gone to that because we still have quite a bit I mean our streets aren't near as small as some of the like Kansas City and the, some of their older older parts of town so uh, maybe someday we'll end up with that but uh, not right now uh, collision avoidance uh, some of you probably have cars that will uh, stop you uh, from running into something a lot of fire trucks are going to that now that's not something we have yet but uh, eventually I'm sure we will. Uh, compressed air foam. That's uh, foam has been used in firefighting for a long time. Uh, kind of a new new thing in firefighting is compressed air, uh, where you it injects foam into the fire stream, and that uh, it uses much much less water to put out fire. A lot of places are going to that. We don't have it yet. We don't use much foam at all, actually. But uh, uh, some places are 
putting much smaller water tanks on their trucks because they have compressed air foam and can fight, put out a lot more fire with a lot less water. So that's probably something that uh, in the future you'll see a lot more of. Uh, and a big thing uh, is electric fire trucks. And it's a, a pretty new uh, concept, uh, not only with just fire trucks, but uh, uh, cars in general, but uh, uh, Lawrence, they have, I don't know if they've taken delivery of it yet, but they've, they've ordered a, an electric fire truck. Looks uh, pretty much exactly like these would, but uh, just has a, a giant battery in it. And uh, I'm on our, uh, our de fire department's uh, apparatus committee that helps spec out these trucks and, and purchase them. Uh, it adds a lot of money to, uh, to the truck. Um, about half a million dollars just for that electric feature. And then another about $300,000 uh, infrastructure in your station to charge those. So um, I don't know you'd ever uh, make the money up in the diesel fuel cost, um, but there's no emissions on them. And that's, uh, that's, what, uh, that's why they're a thing. Um, I don't think we. I know we won't see these for a long time in Manhattan, but uh, eventually, I don't know. Uh, and they say uh, two and a half hours for a full charge if it's down to nothing to a full charge. Uh, obviously, there's the concern that you're out uh, running calls all day, and if you run out of battery, that's not a good thing for a fire truck. Um, not a good thing for a car of any any type, but uh, a fire truck would be uh, out of service for a while if that would happen. So uh, technology is there and improving and maybe someday uh, that'll be the norm, but uh, I think we're a long ways from that in Manhattan anyways. So, uh, so that's kind of, uh, that's what we wanted to talk about here about uh, kind of how technology has advanced uh, through the years with fire trucks and equipment. Um, be happy to answer any questions or, yes sir. Curious. I know you said something about city mechanics. I was, who maintains these trucks and who keeps them clean? That's a lot of equipment. Yeah. And they're always spotless. They're always running. So who does all yeah. that? Uh, so uh, we do that, <laughs> keep them clean and uh, making sure our equipment's ready to go. And uh, we would wash the truck uh, this morning before we came here. Uh, that's uh, maybe not a daily occurrence, but Certainly, if it's dirty, it gets washed. Um, not just the truck, but we, we keep all of our equipment clean. Um, uh, we talked about how expensive they are. Um, I mean, we got to keep them in good working order, so we have them as long as we possibly can. Um, about 20 years is ha the life expectancy of what we should have a fire truck for. Uh, but with budgets and stuff, we've been keeping them longer than that, and most places do. So, yeah. Have you had to purchase new tooling to deal with electrical fires on the electrical uh, the cars and trucks? Have you had special training um, on the upcoming electric cars? So we, we do training on that. Um, and mainly what uh, is just more water uh, for electric cars. Uh, but gaining access to where you need to get the water is is uh, can be a, a big challenge uh, on some makes and models but yeah we do training uh on that and uh, the answer is just more water for those big electric fires uh, some places uh we were talking about this the other day too i think phoenix has this it's basically a, a wrecker that has a big connex box that they come and just put a car that's electric car on fire they put it in this big box and they just fill it up with water so they have a lot more uh, funding than we do in Phoenix, but uh, uh, yeah, there's, yeah, innovations all over the place with that, so, yeah. How do you, how do you number your engines, like this one's number 13, and you've been talking about engine yeah. number four, and some of them have names, how does that work? Yeah, uh, so what we have, uh, we have five fire stations, so the truck that responds out of that station, it gets the corresponding number. So at station one, we have engine one. Uh, station two is quint two. And the difference between a, an engine and a quint 
is, uh, I mean, quint meaning five, uh, you have the aerial ladder on top. So uh, the five things it has on it is a fire pump, water, hose, and ground ladders. So those are the four things that make an engine a fire engine. And then the quint adds the, uh, the aerial ladder. So those are the designations we get for those. But yeah, the number is just corresponds to the station that it uh, responds out of. So. so eventually when engine number four is no longer in service, there'll be another engine number four. Right. Yep. And then actually the, we have some reserve trucks. Uh, so when engine four gets replaced, uh, this truck will actually become engine 14 if that makes any sense. Maybe it doesn't. I probably shouldn't have even said that, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and training. Do you cross train or train specific jobs? Uh, so we're, yeah, we're a small enough department that uh, everybody kind of has to be able to do everything. We have specialties though. We have, uh, uh, I'm a rescue technician, so uh, rescue disciplines, I'm more trained than uh, somebody who's not a rescue tech. Uh, Eric is a uh, hazmat technician, so he's more trained in hazmat stuff than, than I am. But uh, So we have those different disciplines. We're actually from Station 4, which is out at the airport, so we have our aircraft firefighting trucks out there. So we're also, all three of us are trained in aircraft firefighting stuff. So, but yeah, we, everybody knows some about everything, but we do have some specialties and stuff. This is related to infrastructure. With the increase in uh, new buildings, larger buildings, and the building codes requiring more internal uh, fire suppression sprinkler systems, um, how do you handle the situation of being able to actually use the equipment when you have flow rates or other infrastructure problems? that limit your ability to actually fight the fire in the capacity that you need to use uh, The short answer is adapt and overcome. Like, that's what we, I mean, we train a lot for that. Uh, if what we, what our plan is, if it's not working, what are we going to do uh, to do something different and make it work? Um, one, just one example I would say, uh, if we have a, uh, buildings that have standpipes in them and we can hook a truck up to the standpipe outside if something goes wrong and it doesn't work the way it's supposed to we can we have ways to get our own water up there we can drop hose down to the truck and hook into that and basically build our own standpipe um, yeah we we do a lot of training uh, training on about anything you can imagine uh, and adapt and overcome is kind of the, the whole thing in the fire service is if what you're doing isn't working, what can you do to, to try something different? So, yeah. yeah. Is the uh, horse drawn era, some of the large cities like Washington, D.C. had a fire department veterinarian that lived in the fire department because they had a large number of horses. You know, who took care of the horses? Well, as far as I know, we talked about the, you know, the drivers uh, of those teams had uh, a lot more responsibility. So I would imagine that was their deal. They, I'm sure they had a, you know, a veterinarian, uh, probably not on staff because they <laughs> didn't have enough uh, uh, animals for that. But uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's interesting though. It'd be like a, a, a fleet mechanic nowadays, I guess, but having a veterinarian back in those days was kind of the same thing, I imagine. So. And then I understand that in some towns, there was a debate when it went from people pulling the equipment to a horse. There was a lot of pride. People didn't want to give up pulling the equipment to yeah. give way to horse. <laughs> yeah, uh, so we call that tradition in the fire service. Uh, <laughs> And uh, uh, well, uh, one saying that uh, you know the fire service is a uh, hundred years of uh, tradition unimpeded by progress. So, um, yeah. So, how does someone become a firefighter? What's the training length of time before you turn loose? Turn loose on the truck? 
So our hiring process, uh, you don't have to have a lot of certifications uh, in Manhattan. Some places are different, but uh, um, basically you apply and if you, you know, go through quite a hiring process, but when you are hired, then we have a uh, fire academy. It's eight weeks long where we go through kind of a you know, brief scratch the service of all this stuff. Uh, and you come out of academy and you go get on shift and then your crew is kind of responsible for training you and you know, getting you up to speed on all these things. And we have a, your first year, you're a probationary firefighter and you have uh, quarterly uh, evaluations where you're, you have to meet these requirements. And, um, and if you don't, then, you know, see ya. So, uh, yeah. You'll see a lot of fire trucks show up to medical emergencies. Um, are you all trained as paramedics as well? Uh, not paramedics, we're EMTs. So, yep. Um, yeah, we'll run on almost, uh, probably 90% of the uh, medical calls. Uh, so if you see an ambulance, there's probably a fire truck there as well. Um, but yeah, we're all EMTs. Um, that's a requirement uh, of everyone here. Um, so yeah, doing a basic first aid and then a, a basic life support stuff. Yeah, we, we do that stuff. So. Yes. At the end of the lifespan, said the fire department, maybe 20, 25 years, mm -hmm. these trucks, do they have any individual value? I mean, are they sold to smaller towns, communities, volunteer fire department? How are they? How much, what's the loss? I mean, you can't go to your vehicle and trade it in for anyone but right. trade in. So, how does that work? Uh, so, so it, you actually can do some trade-in stuff with our uh, dealers. Um, they don't want to, uh, so they don't hardly give you any money uh, for a trade-in on a fire apparatus. Um, but uh, what they're normally done is we've given we've given some of our trucks to Riley County Fire Department, um, and then sold some other ones just on Purple Wave or whatever auction service. Uh, one of them. Uh, our actual our last open cab truck uh, which was a reserve truck when I started it was an 87 Ford it got uh, bought by uh, somebody who donated it to uh, I think it was like Northern Africa yeah, or something there. yeah. so he, they put some money into it, getting it kind of refurbished and ready to go and then they shipped it to Africa where uh, it was probably the you know the best piece of equipment they had over there I'd I'd imagine, but yeah, they, they go all over the place. Uh, local fire departments, you know, smaller volunteer departments uh, take a lot of these uh, older ones, but yeah. yeah. Does, does every fire station, is, you know, and I mean, uh, and not across the nation, but here in, in Manhattan, do they each have their own big engine and then smaller vehicles, or do you guys kind of share like certain ones, or how does that work? Yeah, so uh, these trucks you see up here, uh, that's what we run all of our calls on. So, uh, it, and I understand like we show up to a medical call with an ambulance and well, why do you need this big truck? Well, we need to have all of our stuff on there so we can go to the next call. You know, if we're on a medical call and we get a call for a structure fire, you know, we're not going back to uh, a station to get something. Uh, we have all our equipment there. We're ready to handle whatever situation. Does each station have a big one like that though? Yep. Oh. Yep. And then we do have, uh, we talked about some specialty stuff, uh, specialty disciplines. Uh, station 3 has a, a rescue truck as well, where it has a lot more, uh, you know, specialized rescue equipment on it. Uh, our headquarters, Station 1, has a, a hazmat truck where, you know, kind of the same thing. So, yep. What are your cross boundary restrictions? And an example I can give, when Nichols Jim burned, I think the university had one little fire truck there, but the city had nothing. Yeah. Uh, so that was uh, before, that was back when uh, K-State had their own fire department. That's not the case anymore. Uh, the city of Manhattan provides fire protection to the, the university. But yeah, back when that fire occurred, yeah, it was uh, uh, their agreement, or they didn't have an agreement, I guess. K-State had their own fire department, they took care of their buildings, and the city stayed away from it. That's not the case anymore. Uh, we actually have a lot of uh, automatic aid agreements with uh, out in the county that we uh, will run calls with them, and, and 
uh, and it's it's more so we'll get there get started and then when the county fire department gets there and has enough resources then we'll come back to the city and, and uh, protect uh, what about with pot county yeah kind of the same thing with that uh, you know out to green valley road you know highway 24 corridor um, city actually owns or uh, you know annex some of that out there but we run automatic aid agreements to some of those places so yeah yeah so who takes care of all the maintenance on these vehicles uh we do a lot of it uh you know kind of light maintenance and just keeping things clean and running but we have uh the city of manhattan their shops department has uh have one one mechanic that uh does most of the work on our trucks so yeah where are all the stations located and what are their numbers uh, so headquarters, which is station one, we call it headquarters, is up at Kimball and Denison by the football field, K-State football field. Station two is at 11th and points by City Hall. Uh, station three is over here off Amherst, just west of uh, Seth Child, or east of Seth Child by the Toyota dealership. Uh, you can't see it from Seth Child, but it's down there. Uh, station four is out on the airport. That's where we're from. Then Station 5 is up uh, Grand Mirror, uh, just off of uh, uh, Kimball and Vanesta. Those are our five fire stations. Yep. One more? One question for you. Yeah. At the start, you were showing the original fire station. Where exactly was it located? Uh, so I think that was on, it was on 3rd Street, and I think it was uh, just north of Points. Just, just north? I, I believe so, yeah.